Hey guys, Miss Marie Sick here, and in this video, we're going to talk about empirical and molecular formulas, as well as refresh our memory on how to calculate these formulas from given data. Um, I first want to talk about a few terms uh, that I want us to kind of start to get familiar with. The first of those is something called the law of definite composition. Now, this law states that um, compounds always contain the same relative mass of constituents, meaning the pieces that make it up, meaning the elements, regardless of the source. To kind of give us um, an example of this, it doesn't matter where on earth I go find water. Water will always have the compound formula of H2O. It'll always be two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen. It'll always be 2.02 grams of hydrogen for every 16 grams of oxygen. Doesn't matter where I find it, it's always going to be in that ratio. Um, so the subscripts in a chemical formula are always the same for any given compound or molecule. Um, however, when we're talking about organic substances, um, sometimes organic substances get really, really big when I have those carbons and hydrogens all linked and branched together. And so sometimes their actual composition, their actual formula can be simplified. The ratio can be in more simple terms. And that's where empirical and molecular formulas come into play. So just as kind of a reminder of some of these terms, uh, first off, a molecular formula shows the exact number of atoms bonded to each other. It's the actual compounds formula. Um, so for example, butane is a common substance that's a hydrocarbon that's used as a fuel when we burn it. Um, it has a formula of C4H10. Doesn't matter what sample of butane I go find, its formula is always C4H10. Um, if I look at its structural formula, the structural formula is a 2D drawing showing how atoms are bonded to each other. Uh, this happens to be the structure butane. You notice it basically looks like a Lewis dot structure just with lines for the bonds instead of dots. Um, however, uh, there are other compounds that have a formula of C4H10. Uh, isomers are when we have the same molecular formula, but they're arranged differently. We have a different structural formula. Um, so for example, butane has an isomer called 2-methylpropane that looks like this. It too is C4. There's the four carbons with the 10 hydrogens around it, but you can see it's organized a very differently than regular straight chain butane. Uh, that gives it some different properties, like this isomer has different melting points and boiling points than the regular butane would have. Uh, by the way, a little preview to some organic naming. Hopefully you remember that but means that we have the four carbons. But you notice here we see meth and prop. Prop means three carbons, meth only means one. So the way that this name works is that the propane is named for the longest chain of three carbons. And then off of the second carbon in the chain, there is a one carbon branch coming off of it. So that's where the methyl comes in. So just a little preview for those of you planning on taking organic chemistry in college. You can have some fun times with that. Um, but to talk about butane here for just a minute, um, while this is the actual formula, it's not really the simplest ratio of those elements. So C4H10 is what we would refer to as the molecular formula. But if I was to simplify it, I could break it down into C2H5. I could half both of those subscripts very easily. Um, this is what we call the empirical formula. So again, the empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio of atoms. Sometimes the molecular and empirical formulas are the same. Uh, for example, in ionic compounds, often the, the two are the same because the actual structure is in the simplest ratio. But for these organic hydrocarbons, there's a lot of times that they are not the same. Um, there is a connection between these two. Obviously, if I because this is the same ratio, if I multiply this uh, formula by a set you know, number, I could obtain this actual formula. Uh, here, if I doubled everything, I could get to that original formula. Uh, that times two is what we refer to as the multiplier. 
Now, the multiplier is one of the things that we're going to be looking at how to solve here in a minute. Uh, basically, there's three things we're going to refresh our memory on how to solve. The empirical formula first, uh, then the multiplier, and then the molecular formula. Um, so as a reminder, the steps to solve an empirical formula, first off, you would be given um, some sort of ratio information. Most of the time, you're given a percent composition by mass. Um, on occasion, you're given mass ratios, and in that case, you don't have to do this first step. But if you were given percent percentages, we assume that the total mass was 100 grams, and so what we do is we take each of the percentages and just put a G at the end for grams. It's literally that easy. The percent to mass step is the easiest step. Next step, mass to mole. We take each of those masses that we had and do a conversion into moles. Now what this step will give us is a ratio of one atom to another. The problem is, is they're going to be in fractional terms. And so the next step is designed to get us to start working toward whole number subscripts, dividing by the smallest. So whichever value ends up being the smallest of the moles, we divide all of them by that number. And if at that point we still don't come out to whole numbers, then we can conquer this last step of multiply to whole. So if we have some fractions that we're you know, familiar with, we can multiply by numbers to undo that fraction. What we have to be careful on is that what we do to one subscript, we've got to do to all of them. So if you do have to do the multiply to whole step, even for just one element, you will have to do it for every single element in there. All right, so let's go ahead and flip to the next page where we're going to talk about actually solving one of these problems. Now, at the top of this, there are some directions for eventually solving molecular formula. We'll get back to that part here in a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and kind of jump into one of these problems just to start to get our brain juices flowing on how to do this. Um, so it gives us a compound here, caffeine, was completely decomposed and found to contain 49.48% carbon, 5.20% hydrogen, 28.86% nitrogen, and the rest oxygen. So they're giving us here a percent composition um, for this substance. Um, so what we want to start off by doing is solving the empirical formula. So this is where I use my saying, percent to mass, mass to mold, divide by smalls, multiply to whole. So what I'm going to start off by doing is by writing down each of the elements that I have. I have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these percentages and assume that those are the masses of each of those elements. So 49.48% will be 49.48 grams of carbon. Hydrogen, I'll have 5.20 grams of hydrogen. Uh, 28 0.86 grams of nitrogen. Now, to get the oxygen, we know that the percentages would tally up to 100%. So if I add these up and subtract them from uh, the 100, I can get the percent of just the oxygen. That comes out to 16.46. So I'm going to assume that that's my grams of oxygen. So that's how easy the percent to mass step is. Okay, next step would be the mass to mole step. So what I want to do is I want to convert each of these masses into a number of moles. And as a reminder, the way to get between moles and mass is to use the molar mass. So for carbon, I know that there's 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. And we'll get an answer for that here in a minute. Um, for hydrogen, there's 1.01 grams of hydrogen for every one mole. Now, notice I'm not addressing um, diatomics here because, again, these are not elements really by themselves. They are in a compound. Um, so I have 14.01 grams of nitrogen for one mole. And oxygen has an atomic mass of 16. All right. Now, when I do this next step here, I want to make sure that I am recording quite a few digits. I'm not done with my math yet. And if you truncate off these numbers too much, you're going to mess yourself up math wise when you do the divide by smallest step. So just keep in mind, show at least four sig figs. Honestly, five, six, or seven doesn't hurt. It just gets kind of annoying to write that many numbers down. So I'm going to actually show five here for each of these. Uh, this first one comes out to be 4.1199. 
This one comes out to be 5.1485. The nitrogen comes out to be 2.0599. And then last but not least, the oxygen comes out to be 1.0287. So what I have here are the moles of each of these in ratio, which means I have an atom ratio as well. For every 4.1199 atoms of carbon, there are 5.1485 atoms of hydrogen. There are 2.0599 atoms of nitrogen and 1.0287 atoms of oxygen in my compound. Yay, I know an atom ratio. Here's the problem though. I can't put these fractional numbers as subscripts. That does not work. So what I need to do next is to do the next step in the same. You've done percent to mass, mass to mole. The next step is divide by smallest. So whichever number of these is the smallest, in this case the 1.0287, I'm going to divide all of these by that 1.0287. Now what that does is that ensures that this guy at least ends up being a whole number. It ends up being 1. For the rest of these, we may come out really close. It depends. If you are within hundredths of a whole number, you are allowed to round to the whole number. If you're not, then you're going to need to leave the fraction and you may need the last step of multiplying it to a whole. Now, what I mean by within hundredths of a whole number, I'm going to plug in this one just so we can kind of see here what this comes out to. That comes out to 4.004. .004. That is pretty much 4, right? I'm within thousandths here of four, not even just hundredths. So I'm going to assume that this is four. Same thing goes for the next one, 5.1485 divided by 1.0287. I see that comes out to five. And this one right here, comes out to be two. So luckily for us, these all came out to be whole numbers, and so I don't need to use the next step in the saying multiply till whole. However, let's say one of these had come out fractional. Let's say like here instead of two, this had come out to be 2.5. I obviously still can't put a fraction as a subscript. I can't put 2.5 as a subscript, so I would need to multiply it to get it to a whole number. Well, being 2.5, being a half, I know I could multiply it by two. Just keep in mind that what I do to one of these numbers, I then have to do to all of them. So if you have to multiply one of these by two to get it to a whole number, you're going to have to multiply all of these by two. Otherwise, you're not maintaining the ratio that you have figured out. So what that means is that I have now solved the empirical formula. The empirical formula will have each of these numbers as the subscripts for those respective elements. So carbon will be 4, hydrogen will be 5, nitrogen will be 2, and oxygen will be 1, which we can just leave blank because that would be understood to be 1. So this is my simplest ratio of elements in caffeine. Here's the deal though, this may or may not be the actual molecular formula of caffeine. So that's where now I would need to do an extra step to this problem. Now up here it kind of gives you a tip on what you need to figure out in order to get to the molecular formula. We need to solve our multiplier. How many times do I need to multiply this empirical formula to get to the actual formula. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to compare molar masses. So we want to find the molar mass of that empirical formula that we just solved. So what I would do is I would solve this guy's molar mass. So carbon is 12.01. I have four of that. I'm going to add that to hydrogen at 1.01, .01, and there's five of it. I'm going to add that to nitrogen at 14.01, and there's two of that, and then I'm going to add that to oxygen at 16, and I find its total molar mass of the empirical to be 97.11 grams per mole. Oops, let's set that down. There we go. All right, so I go look back up here, and it said, hey, caffeine really has a molar mass of 194.19. Well, I see that's not 97.11, so 
So therefore, I know that this is not the actual formula. It's not the molecular formula. So what I need to do now is figure out the multiplier. To do that, what I need to do is compare my molar masses. I need to figure out how many times does this part molar mass fit into the whole entire molar mass. And I do that by dividing those values. So I would take my 194, wait, 19, my given molar mass in the original problem, and I'm going to divide it by the empirical formula that I just solved. Now, if you did everything right, this should come out to really darn close to a whole number. Oops, let me go delete that. There we go. 97.11. And I see that that comes out to 1.999, which basically means that I have a value here of 2 for my multiplier. What that means is that each of these subscripts in the actual molecular formula gets multiplied by 2. So my actual molecular true formula for caffeine would be carbon 4 times 2, which is 8, hydrogen 5 times 2, which is 10, nitrogen 2 times 2, which is 4, and oxygen 1 times 2, which is 2. So this is our true formula for the formula of caffeine. All right, guys, hope that helps. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Bye, guys.